So, um, David is a practice. Here we go. Get ready for all the big words, right? Uh, is a practicing endocrinologist and research at Boston Children's Hospital, professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, professor of nutrition at Harvard School of Public Health, and described as an obesity warrior. I think you've heard this a lot about Dr. Ludwig uh, by Time Magazine. He's been featured in the New York Times, and then it's NPR, ABC, NBC, CBS. Can we put CBC or CTV, our Canadian ones, yet? No, Global. You did yes, you did. Last time you were here, you did do Canadian television. He's written three books, including the best-selling Always Hungry <coughs> from 2016, and the follow-up one, which you all have in your, your book bag, uh, Always Delicious, which was just released this March. So this is new. And um, it's a collaboration with David's wife, Dawn, who for 15 years owned and directed the Natural uh, Epicurean Academy of Culinary Arts in Austin, Texas, which was recognized as one of the top cutting edge cuisine cooking schools in the United States. Don is responsible for translating all of David's science into things that we can use in the kitchen. I call that bridging the gap and bringing it home, right? right. It's a classic example of this, right? Um, please welcome David and Don Ludwig. Here we go. I'm, so now I'm going to sit down and do the classic conversation, but as I sat down earlier, I realized in my pocket I had the cricket protein bar. Did you get that, right? And then the chef's house new lime product line, the salt. I had to take them out of my pocket now because it's, don't anybody steal those. I've got my eyeballs on those. Um, for many of us here, though, we weren't, we were not here that first year. Um, I'd like to talk to you about your two books, obviously, because they are seem to be a companion to each other. But at the same time, you've done, David, groundbreaking studies on overeating. And overeating doesn't make you fat. It's the process of getting fat that makes you overeat. Can you just, and this is also the basis of Always Hungry, can you explain a little bit about the science and how we got to this point, and then we'll, we'll segue to the, the recipes uh, in the new book. Great. Well, first of all, let me congratulate you on the third annual successful conference, and it's such a joy to come up. You're, you're doing such important work. We have a whole world of people who are studying nutrition, you know, a lot of dietitians, but don't know much, and doctors and nutrition experts, who don't know much about food. And then we've got a lot of researchers who are studying the health effects of food, um, but don't know much about culinary. And so you've really, Put them together, Thank and you. that's a, you know, that's an extraordinary combination. So okay. congratulations there. Um, right. So the science behind always hungry um, is to challenge the conventional mindset that it's all about calories. So you know, we've heard it a thousand times, right? If you want to just lose weight, eat less and move more. We think of body weight as a problem of accounting. You know, you too many calories in the body, not enough calories coming out. Um, and so you just have to you know, eat a little less, move a little more. Anybody should be able to do it. If you did it, anybody could take care of a weight problem. So there's just a few problems with this concept. I mean, number one, we know it doesn't work. How do we know that? <laughs> you know, look at the, you know, every single long-term study of obesity treatment. People can lose a few pounds for a few weeks or a few months. But by and large, 90% of the weight is back after 6 to 12 months. After a year or two, people are oftentimes heavier than before they started. So in practice, even though it sounds easy, it doesn't seem to work. Secondly, it actually can't work. Nobody can accurately determine their calorie balance without elaborate scientific machinery. I couldn't do it. If you're off by just 300 calories a day, too much, you'd go from thin to massive obesity in three years. You know, so that's a small error would add up to be a very big problem over time. I mean, after all, think about it. How did people manage to control their weight before the very concept of the calorie was invented about 100 years ago? Yeah. And the third big problem is that it blames people for this failure. You know, if weight loss is just about <laughs> counting calories, eating less, moving more, anybody should be able to do it, and if you can't, it must be your fault. It's your fault if you're fat. This implicit message is internalized in our culture, perhaps explaining why people with a weight problem are blamed 
stigmatized for this problem more than virtually for any other condition. So what this, what this mindset neglects is the biological factors that affect body weight. We know this. This has been demonstrated in the laboratory going back a century. And it's totally neglected in the weight loss clinic and in most diet books. So from our perspective, we're interested in finding out what's triggering our fat cells to store too many calories. And we think that a big culprit is the processed carbohydrates that flooded into our diet during the low fat years. These, what are we talking about? White bread, white rice, potato products, prepared breakfast cereals, all these low fat sauces and, and desserts and snacks. They raise insulin, and we know that insulin stimulates fat cells to gorge. So those fat cells, after you eat, they go on a feeding frenzy. But the rest of the body doesn't have enough calories. So even though the fat cells are feeding, the brain says, wait a second, there aren't enough calories staying in the bloodstream to nourish the brain, the muscles, the organs. And so we get hungry. And that's why we tend to, that's why we say the process of getting fat makes you overeat more so than the other way around. Uh, our approach is to target that problem directly. You know, yes, you can lose weight by counting calories, depriving yourself for a short while, but we know your body's gonna fight back. How? You'll get hungry, and if you can resist that, your metabolism's gonna slow down. I mean, that's a recipe for failure. But if instead you target the fat cells themselves, get them to calm down, suck in fewer calories, there are more calories available for the rest of the body. You feel more satisfied. You're less hungry. You stay satisfied longer after eating. Your metabolism speeds up. And then you can lose weight with your body's cooperation, not with your body kicking and screaming. Understood? <laughs> huh? um, and just to that point, because when you gave this talk, much more expanded talk at the first uh, year of the symposium, uh, and then last year you were also here, you, you were all here as well. Um, I've learned a little bit each year, and I, I just give you my little personal how this works in real life. That I read the book, read, and before the delicious book came out. So the first year Michael Moss spoke and I cut out my cereal, right? The second year I cut out my sugar, right? So I will tell you in the year and a half since now, I've been on blood pressure pills for 20 years. I am no longer on blood pressure pills for the one thing that you've done. So I can say to all of you, and trust me, I'm not walking anymore. I haven't got a Fitbit. I'm not doing anything particularly with my exercise that, any more than I did before. But just tweaking what you talked about and making myself hungry. And I think somebody said it earlier today, the French are hungry for pleasure. We're hungry for a different reason, mm. right? And, and I think we, we look at that differently. So, Sorry, yeah, I think you've, you've highlighted a key point, and this is a, something that we bury in the book. We say it, but we don't lead off. This isn't a diet book. You know, it's no. not a weight loss book. The purpose, you know, both for Always Hungry and Always Delicious, which is a cookbook, you know, is to uh, tune up your metabolism. It's to lower insulin levels and calm chronic inflammation, which we call insulin's twin troublemaker. So when that happens, uh, blood pressure goes down, Certain key lipids improve, like triglycerides and HDL. Uh, inflammation in the body improves, so people might feel less you know, a little arthritis or um, brain fog or the other ways that manifests. And yes, people, we hope that if people are too heavy that they'll lose weight, but that's a side effect mm -hmm. of tuning up your metabolism. We don't try to figure out or tell anybody where your weight should be based on a chart. That's the ultimate of hubris. Your body knows better what weight it should be than any nutrition expert. We just have to give the body a chance by giving it the right influences. Food is central, but we also talk about the three life supports, sleep, quality sleep, which is something I'm still working on, stress relief, and enjoyable physical activities. And that sets the stage. That gives your body the inputs it needs. And then your body does the rest, yeah. finds the weight it wants. You know, maybe it'll lose. Maybe it's not going to be exactly your view of ideal body weight, at least at this stage of your life. Um, but it's going to start moving in the right direction. And then the more supportive you can be for your body, the more your body is going to give you what you want. So Don, 
you have the benefit of having a scientist in your kitchen, basically. <laughs> It's we nice. don't have that luxury. <laughs> um, but after the first year, you, you reach out. You, you are reaching a bigger audience, too. And you have collaborated here at George Brown with the Culinary Management Nutrition Program uh, to the point of coming back and forth in between symposiums, working with the students. And in the new book, all towards the new book, always delicious. And I'm delighted to say uh, the students, there are 16 recipes in there from the students. And I think we have some students in the audience. Yes, uh, would you, we do. five of you? Raise so, your hands. Can you raise your hands, students who have recipes in the new book? <laughs> Congratulations. And that, that's a delightful uh, uh, sidebar to this. But what's it like when you collaborate like this? What did you learn from that perspective of when you were making the new book? And then the new book is a companion. Did you, let me backtrack. Did you know going into writing the first book there would be the second book? No. Oh, okay. Um, no, it was really the first book. We had to see how it did. You know, publishers don't just yeah. let you plan for the second book. No. <laughs> um, but what we found was after the first book, the response was so great. Mm -hmm. And we had people really coming out of the woodwork saying, we want to build a Facebook community. We want to right. build a group that's going to have support. And would that be okay with you? And my answer was, I'll help you do it if you'll moderate it. <laughs> right. And, okay. and so we have these volunteer moderators who got on Facebook and, and started um, going through this plan and recognizing things like you were talking about. Yeah. We call that a non-scale victory, an yes. NSV, NSV. And, yeah, and then the weight loss and non, mm -hmm. lots of non-scale victories. And they said, we want more, we want more, we want okay. more. And the second thing that they said was, how do I do this when I eat out? Oh. How do I do this when I travel? How do I do this when I have um, friends come over? How, I, I have the three weeks of meal plans in Always yeah. Hungry, but what if I get tired of those? Right. And how do I put a meal plan together? And so from that came Always Delicious mm -hmm. and came this idea, like you said earlier today over herbal tea, <laughs> um, for creating the next generation of chefs who are thinking like you have a scientist in your kitchen. Thinking like you have a scientist in the kitchen. I like that. Um, so when you do this collaboration together, um, what did you learn that enriched your approach to cooking? Like, how do you get your inspiration? Did the students inspire you as much? Do when you travel inspire you? Because I know I sat in on one of the taste tests, and it was awesome to watch you say, I think we had an Egyptian student uh, back with Egyptian background and all these different craft brands, and you were so thrilled to see that diversity brought through the recipes and yes. translations. So where do you get your inspiration? So um, I really, I think in another life, I would be a cultural anthropologist. Oh. <laughs> I really love yeah. cultures, and I'm a foodie. I, I, I love food. And um, I spent 15 years training chefs. And right. so I really love this collaboration of bringing these two things together. And as a chef, writing the first book, as I was translating um, David's science, it opened my brain to a new view of what this simple culinary career is. I had to start thinking of macronutrients. I had to start thinking of not only is this recipe delicious, but how does it fit into a meal plan? How do I write it out so that a home cook sees it as easy? Right. And so working with the students and watching those gears hmm. start to move for them and then watching them combine that with their cultural nuances. Yes. And we got such a wide range. I think I tasted for nine hours straight. Yeah, I, I know, I'm sure you did. But it was great. You were a trooper, um, pleasantly so. Um, do you find, you talked about the Facebook community, which I think going back to what we've heard this morning too, is a great hub for credible information too. And I think you're, if, you're, if you are looking for, for information, I would highly recommend that because I do think it's a, a great place. Do you get pushback though on, uh, from other people saying, oh, this is all, you know. He yeah. gets more of that you, than Okay, I so let, how, what's the pushback <laughs> like and how do you deal with it? How do you? Um... Depends who it's from. Ah, you know, okay. It, you know, if it's from an internet troll, you know, I really try not to engage. And um, right. you know, seriously. That's, right. No, absolutely. That's you know, in, rule number one. In, in this day, I mean, 50, you know, obviously there was no social media 30 years ago, but uh, 
it's only recently that I think academics are kind of coming to realize that there is a legitimate role for uh, a, that kind of a public presence. I mean, after all, who's supporting my research? To a large degree, it's the public through, mm -hmm. um, in the United States, through government grants and the like. Um, and to be able to influence public health directly is a great opportunity and benefit, but social media is a powerful tool that can be used positively or negatively, as we all understand. And the, um, especially I find Twitter to be highly susceptible to polarization and attack. There's, you know, most scientific questions, especially in nutrition, are too complicated and subtle to be summarized in 280 characters. And so what that's encouraging is to take extreme positions that are simplified and exaggerated because that gets attention. So the key is to how do you get a message out there, clarify it against unreasonable attack, and not engage in unnecessary ad hominem back and forth, which is ultimately a big distraction. It's a distraction in politics. It's a distraction in science. Um, now, the scientific process is, is designed for um, you know, the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, you're supposed to be able to attack each other's ideas. We just want to keep those attacks focused on the idea and not the person. OK. To that end, then, with research, do you see there are gaps in the research still that need to be sort of funded or, or to be delved into more deeply and dived into? Massive or? gaps. You know, if you're a drug company, interested in creating a drug for just one obesity or diet-related complication, you know, be it for diabetes or blood pressure or high cholesterol or blood clotting tendency. You've got a new idea for a drug. It might even be just a, a Me Too drug entering the same category as something else on the market. And you want a billion dollars to develop it? You can get it because a drug for any of these conditions if they're successful, will be a blockbuster. It will make many billions of dollars. How, but nutrition studies, so these drug studies can be done meticulously. Um, even, you know, there, there have been issues of conflict of interest and bias, but even if you separate it, these big drug studies can be done meticulously with that kind of money. Most nutrition studies limp along on a few hundred thousand dollars, or if you're lucky, a few million dollars, and yet nutrition is much more complicated than drugs. You have to control many more factors. The government isn't stepping into the gap. And as a result, we're still debating some of the same questions that have been around for 100 years, such as you know, what's better, a low fat, a low carb? Should we focus on food quality? What are the key aspects of food quality? We know that all of these chronic diseases today that are bankrupting the economy are related to diet and lifestyle. They're all preventable, and yet we're not doing the necessary research to identify the most effective drivers. It's the ultimate of penny wise and pound foolish. So do you two clash over research, where he, he will be telling you something, you go, there's no way I can translate this information, or it doesn't sound credible. Do you ever have a, a well, I don't know. <laughs> do you ever, clash do you ever on clash? lots of things, not so much that. Not, not on the research, I was just curious, do you ever clash on, on, on theory of, of the research, or are you pretty uh, in sync with that? Don, you can answer this one. Well, I, I think <laughs> that something that we've learned um, since we've been married, David and I are very different people. <laughs> look at us. <laughs> Which one is the more animated she's just one? So, she's just so rational. It's, it drives me crazy. Yeah. Um, right. So we, we also have different nutrition needs. We have different That's probably what needs. I'm asking. Right? And so yeah. I think that being together has actually helped expand our view of what's okay. needed. And you'll see this come through in, in our books because we realize that not everyone needs the same thing. Right. And so rather than clashing, we're able to look and say, David might need a little bit more of this. Mm -hmm. I might need a little more of that. My body does well with this. His body does well with that. And it gives us the ability, and you see this in the Facebook group all of the time, to be compassionate and open yeah. and help guide people 
to learn to listen to their own bodies because you, once you get your body kind of um, more trustworthy, your body knows better than any doctor or book can yeah. tell you. And that level of learning is what we want. Yeah. And it comes from us being two different people who need different things. And, and I think there's a, also even a more basic way of looking at this, which isn't you know, so much about us as to the relationship between science, you know, nutrition science, and culinary. Oftentimes, we it, sort of reflexively think there's a, there's a conflict. Healthy versus tasty. Mm. And the whole purpose of Always Delicious is to resolve that. It shows that you can alter your taste. When you alter your fat cells, you know, when your fat cells calm down and there's more calories, a more stable sort of fuel supply to your brain, you're no longer craving those foods mm -hmm. to raise your blood sugar so quickly. So you're no longer going to be craving the most processed, so-called high glycemic foods. And it, then it gives your taste buds a chance to evolve. A lot of people's taste buds are arrested at about an 18-month-old stage, you know, in an infantilized <laughs> state. And I'm, I'm, literally, I mean, it's, the, it's what you started out with, yeah. is the sweet, salt, so. fat. Very little uh, appreciation for complex tastes, mm. bitter, sour, pungent. And that's what food industry has propagated and profits from. Mm. So we're trying to help step into that gap and heal it. I do, I, and to your point, when you talked about the tastiness too, and I just refer to this because I made a note of it. In your, in the new book, um, you have science bites. Can I just say I love your science bites? And one of them was where you explained craving. And we craving have Chef, Chef Don's tasty tips. And Chef Don's tasty <laughs> tips, but the science by explaining cravings doesn't equal tastiness on page eighteen. Um, for those of you, but it's an, I mean those are interesting things that like craving and tastiness and, and well that's exactly on the point you know, yeah. we were just discussing that this re related to a study we did um, involving something called functional MRI you know you've all heard of MRI functional MRI is a way you can look into the brain in real time and see what's happening what parts of the brain are lighting up or quieting down so we use that technique. Um, in somebody was saying, who is it, Nisha, about you know if you're eating broccoli? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we d actually did a study which was double-blinded, where people didn't know what they were eating. We created two milkshakes. One was made of slow digesting carbohydrate and the other fast digesting carbohydrate that would raise blood sugar and insulin. But otherwise, they looked the same, tasted the same, and even the experimenters didn't know which was which, so it was double blind. We gave it to the people on different days, our participants, and then we did brain scans four hours later. And we saw that after that fast digesting milkshake, so this will be the same thing as happens after you, you know, eat a bagel and fat-free cream cheese and orange juice for breakfast, a few hours later, we found that an area of the brain lit up like a laser, and that was called the nucleus accumbens. So, um, I was, I'm not a neuroscientist. I didn't know what that was either. That's the brain area involved in, in the classic addictions of cocaine, heroin, alcoholism. So it suggests that we start craving these fast digesting carbohydrates not because they're so tasty. Because remember, the, they were designed to have the same sweetness. And this is four hours later. I mean, you probably don't want, remember exactly what your breakfast tasted like at this point. So it suggests that these processed carbohydrates drive craving, not because they're inherently so tasty, but they create a metabolic problem that can only be solved by eating more of them. And, but that the, the good news is that you can get off that craving and addiction cycle with just one meal. You can quiet that part of the brain down. Which segues with just one meal to, to, to Don. I'm going to call you chef. Um, People, and you, you talked about breakfast, a lot of people skip a meal, right. and a lot of people skip breakfast. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, is this unhealthy, or? Well, it's back to what I was saying earlier, it depends on who you are, you know. So it, it could be a pro, it could be. I think that for the majority of people mm -hmm. who are starting our program, their bodies might be, they might be overweight, but they're basically starved. 
Okay. Their fat cells have hoarded so many of their calories that there's none left for the body. So the body thinks it's starving. Mm -hmm. And so our approach, rather than traditional diets where you would deprive yourself of calories and you would whip your body into shape and over exercise and yep. like we, we get rid of that deprivation, we want to nourish our bodies to health. So it's this calming of inflammation, it's calming the fat cells, it's nourishing your body in. In that beginning stage, you definitely do not want to skip breakfast. Definitely don't want to skip breakfast. You want your body to start mm -hmm. out going, oh yeah, I can trust. Okay, whew, I'm yeah. gonna get food and I'm gonna get food at regular times and it's gonna be food that my body's gonna use, not just store. Right. Now, once you've been through this and you find that your body's stable, you find that your body has adapted to this way of eating, then some people might find that waiting to eat until 10, 11, 12 mm -hmm. o'clock might actually support their body. Right. Uh, but you have to keep listening. To your body. To your body. Yeah. And you have yeah, to the, keep the, nourishing yourself. The key issue there is um, getting fat adapted. You know, I don't know if we mm. want to talk. I know somebody had a question about fat and is fat healthy. We like fat. Fat, you know, especially things like olive oil, um, avocado, nuts. These kinds of fats are among the healthiest things you can eat. They don't raise your blood sugar insulin at all. They're really good for inflammation. And so as you transition off of the processed carbs, fat gives you a sense of satisfaction. It's delicious from a culinary standpoint. And your body becomes adapted to that. When you get fat adapted, then that means your fat cells can store calories after you eat and then release it very quickly when the meal is done and you need those calories. So when you're fat adapted, you can skip a meal and you're not very hungry. And so that's the basis of intermittent fasting, which some folks heard about that. That's kind of mm. popular these days. So intermittent fasting can be really helpful if your body's prepared for it. And if you're not, it's the, exactly the wrong thing to do. And um, I want to say yeah, one thing. Being fat adapted doesn't mean you have to get rid of <clears throat> carbohydrates. I love what Christine said. We're not vilifying any one macronutrient. We use good quality carbohydrates and in the different phases, different types of carbohydrates to support your body to adapt in different ways, but never get rid of them completely. Um, and in the book you talk, to segue to ingredients a little bit here, you use... Um, uh, the food grade essential oils in replace of uh, fresh herbs. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that was interesting. Right. Well, a few of my goals when I was mm -hmm. writing Always Hungry, but especially Always Delicious. Number one, I'm a foodie. has mm -hmm. to be delicious. I mean, if it's not delicious, don't eat it. <laughs> um, number two, it has to be quick and easy. Mm -hmm. You know, part of the themes of this program is taking it home. Well, to take it home... It has to be easy. You have to be able to do it. It has to be simple, quick, things like that. Um, and then a lot of people might be cooking for one or cooking for a family, and you don't have a whole bunch of um, lemongrass just hanging out in mm -hmm. your fridge. Um, so how do I get those restaurant-quality flavors quick and easy in a way that my family's gonna love it and it's on the table and I don't have to go to the grocery store. And my answer, one of my answers to that is food grade essential oils. So mm -hmm. I do a um, Thai coconut curry mm -hmm. soup in, that's one of our favorite recipes. And I don't always have lemongrass, but I have lemongrass essential oil and a mm -hmm. few drops gives this bright, fun, delicious flavor. Um, I might be, I love using fresh ginger Mm -hmm. One of my tasty tips is all yeah. the different ways you can store fresh ginger to yeah, use it quickly. Yeah. Love mm -hmm. it. And if I'm out, and I just usually am not, but if I just happen to be, I've got food grade essential oil. So it's it's a it's a hack. It's a it's quick a hack. Okay. It's it's a, a quick hack. hack. It's a yeah. quick tip, um, and it's delicious. And I love your bit about I love leftovers. Does anybody like? Some of my I love leftovers. And you have a great tip about leftovers, though, in saying that you add one fresh ingredient Always. 
just anything. I mean, it sounds like you just add a herb or it could be something, just some one fresh ingredient to that leftover to give it a kick and a boost and-, yeah. and Vibrancy. That. Vibrancy. I've been called the queen of leftovers <laughs> because I can take a leftover anything and turn it into something that you would never know was leftover. So you take maybe like a leftover cauliflower soup and you've got this much of it. And people will say, why are you saving that? Mm. And I'll add it to a sauce and put it into a casserole that makes, like you did the, the cauliflower with the pasta yes. and cheese. A little cauliflower mm. is gonna make it delicious, but I've already have this delicious, well-made soup that would take me hours to replicate. Right and I can turn it into something else. Or I have the leftover roasted chicken and I'll turn it into a chicken salad with a few grapes and walnuts. Uh, so yeah, and then if I have a soup and I'm serving the same thing, the next day I might take a big handful of arugula mm -hmm. and, and add it in. Or just put the arugula in the bottom of everybody's bowl and put the hot soup ladled over the top so it's this bright, fresh yeah. burst of that peppery taste. The vibrancy. Into your yeah. soup. Yeah, I, I've had that yeah. rule since I owned a culinary school, so okay. 20 years. Yeah, it's a great it, one. I'm gonna institute works. that. Yeah, I really like that idea. Um, and it goes to the point of not throwing out food, you know, food waste that if you Absolutely. can give it some extra life. I'm gonna maybe do a couple of more questions, but I want you to start thinking of yours, because I want you to have a dialogue here with, uh, with our guests. Um, what do you say to those people, Don, who say, I have no time to cook? And I know Nish has talked about this, Christine's talked about it, we've all sort of talked about it today, and I'd like to hear what you say. Uh, you have less time for being sick. Oh, you have less time for being sick. Hmm. That's, right? a, that's it in a nutshell. It really is. Uh, cooking, for me, cooking is an investment. And if you have to, make it fun. Turn on some fun music. <laughs> yeah. Pick your favorite ingredients. Let make a game out of it. Whatever you have to do, make it a meditation. Um, but food is an investment. Mm. Cooking is an investment. And when you eat well, our Facebook group, we've got over 13,000 people in oh. there. And over and over and over again, what we hear is this improved, that improved, my blood pressure is yeah. better, yeah. my GERD is better, my whatever it is that they're, they're dealing with. I have more time for my grandkids. I have more energy for my yeah. kids. I have more, I'm hiking a mountain. I walked a mile. Whatever it is, those parts of your life where you feel healthy and you feel good in your body and you have more time to do the things you love, that's worth more don't forget than the I stories, don't have time to Don't cook. forget the stories on middle-aged sex improvement. That's right. <laughs> those are always the best. We do okay. have those on a regular basis. We've now segued to the Sexual Ambition Nutrition <laughs> Conference. More to come next year. Um, <laughs> you, don't, you don't necessarily burn off a lot of calories. But... <laughs> Who, Who says? Right? Who says? Um, <laughs> um, well, I was going to ask you something, uh, I, and I want to ask the audience, how many of you are going out to buy egg beaters now, by the way, after Benji's, uh, I just realized I'm going to buy my, I'm going to buy the egg beaters now. Um, so that just totally knocked your mind It totally knocked you right off. <laughs> yeah. No, it's fine. By I'm the way, just, just uh, please, no, you've I know all got copies of the books, join our Facebook group, it's called The Official Always Hungry Book Community, it's free and non-commercial. We, we invite you to join, share your expertise. We're trying to create a grass movement for social change as well. You know, the idea that we first heal ourselves, but then we join together to try to make the world a healthier place to be. So we'll look forward to seeing you there uh, yeah. online. And David and I interact there on a regular basis. We love working with our readers and connecting and hearing stories and giving advice. You'll even questions. see Moira there. Yeah. yeah, and George Brown and, and the students, and it, it's a great, great it's a hub. Great um, I think, Marilyn, do you have the chat box again? <laughs> Yay, Marilyn. Okay, Marilyn, let her rip. Um, 
Yeah, no, I was just really curious about that milkshake recipe that you were talking about. So what were the ingredients, and when you said you sweetened them with something to make them the same sweetness, what did you use? Like, give me the, give me your your recipes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious milkshake. because you have fast carb, slow carb. Like, what were the other, you know, what were the other variables? Mm -hmm. He's thinking. <laughs> Who's answering? It's classified. <laughs> Wait, did you well, the milkshake that you did. Oh, for the for, for the study? test. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, that was just a. Re I mean, that wasn't a culinary creation. That was a. <laughs> That was a scientific. I didn't do we, that you one. know, we created those to test a hypothesis. Not we weren't concerned with, you know, maximizing flavor. But, um, you know, so when I, you say milkshake, like you're talking milk with just like well, let me, one. Well, just source. just one thing. Like when so Don does know some science, and I do know some culinary. <laughs> and so we that's that's one way that we've actually collaborated. That we each know a little bit about the other's area of expertise, and so. When Dawn was, we were, I tasked her to, she wasn't unfortunately officially a uh, co-author on the first book, on the last one, although she's definitely. Although you know, I did the work. Did, did a lot of work <laughs> in making the meal plan. She, she gets half the profits because of the community property and the marriage. So don't, don't feel too badly for her. But, um, but I, I, I tasked her to come up with um, breakfast shakes that did not, especially for phase one, did not have any added sugars of any kind. And I said, here's the trick, energy density. You know, so energy density has gotten a bad reputation because you know, that's how many calories there are per bite. And so if you're into a low fat diet, if you're into calorie counting, you want a lower energy density. Um, we're coming at it the opposite way. High fat foods are very satiating they're also luscious because they're so full of calories. And what that makes, what happens in your mouth is when you make something very energy dense, of the little bit of sweetness that you might get from a few berries magnifies by tenfold. And so I said, you know, she was saying this is not working and it's just not quite enough. And I said, put in heavy cream and you'll see what will happen. And the next morning she came back to me and she said, it's amazing, <laughs> right? It was. So, so that's the thing. We, you know, we're trying to create, uh, get, get off of, get away from the need for sugar by a combination of mostly you know, healthy, high-fat foods and the right balance of protein and carbohydrate. Well, and I'll say to that, the first year on my quest, um, unbeknownst to me, I got rid of the cereal and switched it with the uh, natural but high-fat yogurt with fresh fruit, and that's now my until somebody comes along and tells me that's not right. Um, um, which, which, is a, which actually segues to a question, do you feel that the science we have now will be replaced by new research 10, 15, 20 years from now? I'm just hoping I make it to retirement before the whole thing gets <laughs> blown off the scale. <laughs> But do you, no, think, do you think there's going to be forward movement that even now what we're talking about today could be obsolete? You know, um, <laughs> I, I'm, you know I, I obviously, obviously I've got some attachment to these ideas, but it's interesting because you know, the people who, who I'm struggling with right now, the, you know, a lot of the um, heads of the professional diabetes and nutrition associations, that are resisting, I don't mean just my work, but I've got a lot of colleagues who are doing this kind of work. They made major contributions to the field 20, 30, 40 years ago, and somehow there's this tendency that, all right, we got it right, now let's just lock it in. And uh, that's a closed mindset that we're encountering where we're trying to question the calorie, out, calorie in, calorie out view. Now, then the question becomes, 20 years from now, like if some of these ideas become you know, the standard way of viewing, some young whippersnapper, kind of like I was uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago, is going to come by and challenge some aspect of these ideas with something new. That doesn't mean that they're right, but the obligation is for us to always be keeping an open mind. One thing, I, one thing that gives me a little bit of confidence that at least some aspect of this has enduring value is that it's actually re, it's reestablishing a connection to how humans have always eaten that was forgotten during the calorie-obsessed, low-fat years when 
foods that had never existed, frankenfoods, were advertised as healthy because they were low fat or reduced in calories or reduced in saturated fat and sodium. But you'd look at them and these were factory products that you know, our ancestors would never recognize. What we're talking about are whole foods um, that work with bi basic biological mechanisms, stabilize your hormones. They're pretty consistent with how many cultures would have been eating. And so I think that's the acid test when you hear a new scientific idea. Does this, you know, does this ring true based on what we know about humans dating back thousands or hundreds of thousands of years? So to that point, Don, I know we've got the chat box somewhere here. Um, do we get hung up on numbers too much, like you know, cholesterol like this, and, and then it's sodium, and then it's fat? Like, what do you say when we're cooking? Like, do we just cook and not worry about the numbers? I personally have no clue about that. I mean, I'm sort of aware of sugar, but that's difficult because they don't put the percent next to it, like the right. uh, daily intake. Um, what would you say? Are we, hung are we just got to get beyond the numbers? Well, this is something that uh, we deal with a lot on the Facebook group, because mm -hmm. people get into that. There are all these apps and you put all your meals into your apps and you get the number. It drives me crazy. I want people to just get away from the apps, just eat good food. However, we have put our bodies into such unnatural states that they're no longer trustworthy. Mm. And so there is a period of time during which you have to reset your body's cravings, your taste buds, your, your body signals, you have to relearn what those are. And so we've got the phase one, phase two, phase three mm -hmm. ratios. And That's one cool. of the reasons we did Always Delicious was so that we did that for you. Okay. You can go, you can make our recipes, you can look at the meal plan suggestions for every recipe. We've got phase one, phase two, phase three meal plans. You eat those. You check your ratios if you're mm -hmm. feeling off, but you go back to listening. You listen to your body. What does okay. it feel like when I eat a meal that's good for my body? Okay. And once you get there, you let go of the numbers. Of the numbers. But, so okay. numbers can be helpful for resetting, for tweaking, right. for getting your body in a trustworthy state. Okay. And, in, and at the end, it's really what feels good. Okay, I'm going to take that from this year. I'm going to dispense with all the numbers. Yes. Okay, that's this year's goal, I think. There, I saw the chat box. Where did it end up? Yes, oh, right into the light. Sorry. Keep that. Um, We've got a limited amount because they have a flight to catch, so we can keep it moving so we can get a bunch of questions. That would be great. Don and David, can you talk about alcohol? Because there's so many conflicting messages. Uh, Health Canada <laughs> says women can have a whole drink a day, which sounds like a lot to me. And I always tell clients if they're trying to lose weight, they shouldn't be drinking. And you, on page 48, it says, just stop for two weeks. And is that, is that because that's a compromise and it's really better to stop longer? Where's, what's your view on alcohol? Well, can I just interject? Uh, those of you who had alcohol at lunch, just take a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> take a deep breath. OK, and fire away. Yeah, uh, well, there's no one right answer there. We ask people to stop for two weeks during phase one so that they can re-establish an awareness, a connection of, with their body off of alcohol. And then to see when they, if they choose to add it back, how it's affecting them. You know, until you clean the metabolic slate, you know, you can't really, it's like um, coming out of a rock concert, you know, you might not realize quite how it's affecting your nervous system until you get outdoors and you hear the birds chirping and it's <laughs> quiet and you go, wow, it's really nice to be out of there. And uh, so we want to do that. And we find that um, some people really uh, wind up making a key breakthrough out of a plateau that they've reached that they couldn't get through, that they finally get through that plateau only by giving up alcohol, whereas other people seem to do okay with a drink or two. Um, you know, and I think there's, there's also some interesting um, potential cardioprotective effects, but that's really more for middle-aged men. Um, for women, the balance, because alcohol also raises risk for breast cancer. So the trade-off is not so, so great for women. And so I'd say that you know, if it's enhancing your enjoyment and not affecting your 
energy, your sleep, okay. But maybe we can do without it. Okay, I'm not taking that piece of advice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Not for this year. Not for this year. I'll come back to you on that one. Um, yes, Christine. Have a question for I was going to say, well, Christine's got the chat box, but Benji's up here to answer questions too about what he does with those egg beaters. Okay. Christine? Um, I have a question about uh, cholesterol and kind of atherosclerosis and the whole uh, cardiovascular system because. There's a lot of conflicting opinion, advice, all of that. Uh, conventional medicine still says, you know, oh, you have high cholesterol. I've heard that they're not really counting that as a risk factor so much. But yes, yeah, stop eating butter, don't eat cheese, uh, whatever. It's very kind of linear. Um, what are you finding with regards to that? Benji, should I handle this one? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, cholesterol is, so the LDL, that's the cholesterol you're talking about. You know, it is a risk factor. There's, there's no question that, you know, the, I think the, the mechanisms are pretty clear. But there's different kinds of cholesterol, there, LDL cholesterol. There's what's called small, dense LDL cholesterol that's really bad. And then there's big, fluffy particles. And then there are other risk factors that are also very important, such as triglycerides, HDL, cholesterol, blood sugar, inflammation. So if you go on to a lower carb diet like this, what's going to happen is your triglycerides are going to go down. That's really good. Your HDL cholesterol is going to go up. Your, and those are part of what's called the metabolic syndrome. And your blood sugar hopefully improves. Your LDL cholesterol won't improve just by this. Um, and if you switch to, um, if you give up carbohydrates and eat more butter, your LDL cholesterol might go up. <coughs> Although that could be this more fluffy, less adverse kind. But if, if you do have concerns for LDL cholesterol, you can accomplish both by reducing the processed carbs, increasing fats, but emphasizing unsaturated fats. So do it the way that the you know, Italians or the French, well, more the Italians than the, or the Greeks, which is, you know, have more olive oil. Exactly, yeah. The una face, una race, right? Isn't that what they say? One face, one race. Uh, you know, so have more olive oil uh, over the butter, over the cheese. You know, that's an easy substitution. And then you really can have your low carbohydrate cake and eat it too. Question in the middle here. So we heard a lot about food policy this morning, and I'm just thinking about like you and your family with your child. When you're not at home and your child's at school, how do you support the, your environment in order to help your child to eat better? Benji. <laughs> when, so, so Benji, how do we make our environment, especially as it relates to kids' health, better? Do you, do you have any thoughts about that? Go ahead. You can. <laughs> <laughs> well, they tell my friends about it and give my friends, like at my birthday, they gave my friends sushi mats so that they could make sushi at home. And, and remember the MCAS? So MCAS are the tests for... Standardized tests. Standardized tests for kids in the United States. So what did uh, your mom do on that day for the school? On that day, me and my mom made... Um, Snacks for my class. Of what? Were of they cookies and crackers and stuff? <laughs> no! <laughs> what, what did you make? We made this thing I made up called Fakin. It's where you get egg, an egg and some cheese and smoked salmon, and you make it into a pancake shape. And we also made. You had some hummus? Yeah. And some vegetables. So that like was you know good for kids thinking went for the exam, but it also set an example, right? I don't know if that's what you're getting at with the question, but um. and actually several of the kids later said, um, Mrs. Ludwig, are you going to make snacks for our next one too? <laughs> <laughs> so all of the recipes in Always Delicious are kid tested. Um, they we have kids at our house all the time for play dates, and um, and we even had for Always Hungry we had taste tests where I had kids all the way around the table with P 
pieces of paper, tasting recipes and, and giving writing their feedback. comments. Yeah, yeah. And David, I just you've got recipes in the book too, not just. He a, does. Yeah, I just want to make clear that it's an equal partnership in the recipe. Thank you. I was beginning, <laughs> I just, I was yeah, I just beginning you know. to feel very sad. Yeah. I, um, I hate to say this, but this will be the last question if I get right over to swing Hi. to my right Thanks. here. Hi, yes. I'm Kara Rosenblum. I'm a registered dietitian and a food writer. My question is around the concept of this. I haven't read the book yet, obviously. It's in the bag. I haven't looked through it. But my question is around the concept of a diet book. Um, as dietitians, we like to individualize our practice and treat everybody as an individual because, as you said, what you need and what your husband needs are not going to be the same thing. Then you're talking about energy density. And there is a diet book by Barbara Rolls called Volumetrics. How is someone to go into a bookstore and know that one diet plan is better for them than another diet plan without a professional like a dietitian letting them know. Who is this book meant for and how do they know that? How do they know this is the right plan for them? Good question. Do you want to do that one? You want me to? Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how, do, how does someone know that our diet book I mean, we, it's really not a diet book. It's, well, it's, it's a way of life. Places. And I think what we've done, because as you've heard from our, from our answers, we really do believe that it's individualized. And we want to empower people to use our book to find out what works for them. So you'll notice, uh, especially if you read Always Hungry, the first book, we have a three-phase program. Phase one is two weeks where you reset. With respect, um, that's a diet, though, is what well, I'm saying. Well, it is a diet, and I'll get, so phase two, you add in certain other things. Um, and then phase three is for your entire life. Now, in a book, we're going to have to give kind of structured programs. This is what generally works for a general population as a beginning of an experiment. If you go onto our Facebook group or you read some of the things that we talk about, uh, online and with our readers is we're continuously encouraging people to experiment. And if they can, go to a dietitian, go to, um, go to the, talk to their healthcare professional, but also to pay attention to their own body. So if you do well in phase one, maybe you stick with phase one for months. You know, let, me, let me just, um, I, I think what you're getting at is um, a challenge, you know, you as a dietitian, how do you know what book to recommend to your clients, if at all? How do you know who should be on a low fat? It's more that, that if the client doesn't have a dietitian, the average person yeah. goes into the bookstore yeah. and there's shelves and shelves filled with diet yeah. books. So that's and we're talking about them knowing the one that's right for them. That's impossible for them to know. Well, but that's that, of course. And um, our job isn't to solve that. It's to offer, you know, it's to offer an approach that's based on, you know, my life's research. You know, I, I, you know, I do this for my day job. This is my best shot together with a practical program that offers an alternative to the mainstream thinking for 30 or 40 years that hasn't worked, which is calorie counting and fat reduction. Now, which you're works for some people, right? You're saying mm. that this your plan works for everybody, but you were also saying no, I didn't that say there's that. different that there's different right diets for different people. Some people do well on more protein or more. I, fat I'm or not more saying carbs. that this is uh, necessarily best for everyone, and I'm keeping open the possibility that science is evolving. My point was that we I wanted to offer a science-based alternative to the focus on calories and fat restriction that seems to have caused more problems than it has solved. And ultimately, you know, and I got testimonials from readers, which other books have, although these are all real, and I got endorsements from leaders of the field. And so ultimately, people have to decide, is it worth giving it a try? Uh, or they can join our Facebook group and before they buy the book. And if, if it doesn't work, you know, that, that's the well, risk you take, but you're risking you know, 1595, you know, that's ultimately the risk. <laughs> um, I will interject in that and say that I am not notoriously very good at following specific things when you tell me phase one, phase two. I jumped around a lot in the first book and it obviously worked for me. But again, it has to be, again, listen to yourself and how, what is your daily, what is your daily routine and how does that work, I think, as well. But I know whatever you're telling me is credible. And I think that's the crucial part is going to the resources that are credible to your point. And, uh, it's based in sound science. Sound science, as opposed to what Nisha just talked about us earlier, which all the 
Mm. All the stuff that's not credible, shall we say. Um, and I, I, we leave room it, for other options. Like if you notice in the recipes, almost every recipe has a vegetarian version, has a dairy-free version, has a gluten-free yeah. version. So we leave that room for if you, if you do better on a, as a vegetarian or a vegan or you're allergic to eggs or whatever your issue is, there's room here to expand out and find what you need, which is rare, I think, in, in, in diet books. On that note, I'm going to say thank you. We have to wrap it up. Thank you. Ben oh, Benji has the last word. The last word. Go ahead. One of my favorite foods is kimchi. Okay. <laughs> ah, there we go. <laughs> thank you very, very much. Um, we're going to get...